to all of us, uh, sports fans, non-sport fans. My wife wasn't really a sports fan, but she like was shocked when she got the news on her iPhone. And um, so uh, I want to take some time today to talk about four lessons we can learn as people, as business people, as investors, as real estate investors from the too short life of Kobe Bryant. But before I do, I've got to ask if you can hear me. And so let me know if you can hear me. Um, I need to hear from my friends over here on YouTube and my friends on uh, Bigger Pockets and my friends here on Facebook. Just give me a, a shout out. Let me know if you can hear me before I go any further. My mic's on, but I don't see any comments coming through at all. So Visions Epic, thank you. Pragmatico, everyone wants to make money from Kobe. What a shame. Mathis says, we can hear you. Blue Pump, yes, dude real estate. Okay, dude real estate. So folks, um, on the YouTube side, if you have any questions, hey, Curtis Bennett, good on Facebook, thank you. Hey, Ken Davis, okay, got it. So if you... Um, have a question, we're going to do about 30 minutes of Q&A after I talk about these four life lessons from the life of Kobe Bryant. But if you have a question you cannot wait for, you can put it in on the YouTube side over here. And our, my good friend Nate Shields, who's also a Bigger Pockets writer, and he has a real estate training coaching program in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, but it's nationwide. He will try to answer your questions. But if you can wait about 20 minutes, we will answer them all together. So I think some of you might have missed my intro. So again, I'm Paul Moore from Bigger Pockets and Wellings Capital. And today we're going to talk about four life lessons from Kobe Bryant. You know, whether you're a sports fan or not, you've got to admire somebody who really, really wanted to be the best. Kobe said, I'm not the fastest guy at all in the league. I don't have the highest vertical jump. I'm not the strongest guy. But he determined in his heart that he would be the very, very best. And so Kobe Bryant has, at 41 years old, left his mark on the world as, um, as a basketball player, as a human being, and as an investor, and we're going to find out more about that today. If you haven't heard, he was also a fantastic investor. And by the way, I'm not trying to make any money, and neither is Bigger Pockets, off Kobe Bryant's life or death. We're just trying to take some life lessons while this pain is fresh. And whether it was painful for you or not, it was for a lot of people. So, um, so basketball lost one of its greatest stars. The world's lost a philanthropist who generously donated to things that were meaningful, uh, a husband, a father, a capitalist. Uh, and I want to go over four life lessons we can learn from the life of Kobe Bryant. So first of all, loyalty. Now, some people would debate this, but let's look at the positive. Let's be glass half full type of people here, right? Um, it's, this is a trait that's been largely lost in America these days. The last generation or two, people have lost uh, loyalty. My friend was was and is the um, Detroit Lions chaplain, and he was talking about how disappointed he was uh, when so many of the players just broke their contract just to get more money, either with their team or another. They just broke it, and they just had the power to do it because they were their own man. And so Kobe stayed with the L.A. Lakers his entire career. He was traded the day of the draft by the Charlotte Hornets uh, 24 years ago. And his career spanned two decades, from 1996 to 2016. He was the second youngest player ever drafted out of high school at 17. And he could have been lured away by a championship ring offer, or the glitter of a few million dollars from another team, and I'm sure he was tempted to do so. But for the sake of his reputation, his coach, his teammates, his family, his legacy, he decided not to. And so life lesson number one, consider your loyalty. 
We'd all do well to consider where our loyalties lie. Have we made promises to an employer? What about to employees who work for us? What about a spouse, our parents, our children? What loyalties do you have and how important is that to you? You know, there's a lot of skills that can be trained by, can be attained by training. There's a lot of stuff you can pick up through mentoring and coaching. A lot of things can be learned in college through school. But loyalty is an inner character trait, a barometer that puts our values on the anvil. Truth and lies, generosity and greed, they're all tested in our lives. And loyalty or lack of loyalty is demonstrated for everybody to see. And I tell you what, those who fail this test win, I guess, but it's only a temporary victory because uh, I truly believe that history will smile on those who are most loyal. Uh, loyalty often looks like, the in, like putting other people's interests above your own. Maybe you're doing real estate investing on the side and you're tempted to take hours away and computer stuff, time away from your employer to do that on the side. Well, maybe that's not a really good idea. Loyalty would say, do it on your own time and uh, do what's right before your employer. Uh, loyalty to your wife, to your husband, to your family. These are all really important. And um, Kobe demonstrated loyalty to the game of basketball and to a uh, guy named LeBron James who surpassed his scoring record. He was number three in the record books. The day before he died, like half a day before he died, uh, LeBron James on the court in Philadelphia surpassed Kobe's record and Kobe tweeted his congratulations to him. And that's the last tweet that we know of. Uh, I think it is the last tweet from Kobe Bryant. You know, you're never going to know when the conversation you have, maybe even, you know, uh, some conversation you have with a spouse or an employee or a, someone at the drive through at McDonald's will be your last conversation. Kobe Bryant finished really well in this regard. He's going to be remembered as somebody who, in general, at least in some many areas of his life, were, was a loyal person. So how are you? Are you acting in alignment with your uh, desire to be a loyal person today? Or are you cutting corners? That's the first lesson from Kobe Bryant. The second one is focus and work ethic. Kobe's going to be remembered for his unbelievable focus and work ethic. Even in high school, he arrived at practice at 5, practice at 5 a.m. and he finished at 7 p.m. After a hard practice session, he would recruit players to play to 100 just one-on-one. -on -one. And by the way, the closest anyone ever got to Kobe was 100 Kobe, 12 opponent. 100 to 12 was the highest anyone ever scored against him. Even as a pro, he kept players after practice to try new moves uh, against them. Bryant kept a running tally of all the points he scored in practice, and he wouldn't stop. He wouldn't go to the locker room until he scored 400 points in a practice. He even did grueling workouts on game days. Now, I'm going to get down on the floor right now and show you what a suicide push-up looks like. No, I'm not. Uh, Kobe Bryant did suicide push-ups on game days. ESPN's Rick Riley said, among other drills, Bryant does suicide push-ups. At the top of the push-up, he launches himself up off the mat so hard that both his feet come off the ground and his hands slap his pecs. He does three sets of seven of these on game day. Bryant retired as a result of three painful injuries. Through his pain, though, he scored 60 points in his last ever game on April 13th, 2016. Uh, even after he ripped uh, an Achilles tendon, um, he stayed on the court to shoot two three free throws, and those two scored free throws made the difference of two points in their win. Uh, against the Warriors that night when he tore his Achilles tendon. I think that was in 2013. Now, we're talking about focus and work ethic. As an entrepreneur and investor, you guys, you know who know me, you know that my biggest mistake over the years was a lack of focus, chasing shiny objects. But as the Chinese proverb says, he who chases two rabbits, rabbits catches neither. 
Saying yes to the one thing you want to be remembered for in this life might mean saying no to a thousand or ten thousand distractions. Now, Kobe modeled this for all of us. So the question for you today is, and me, what do we want to be remembered for? And what price are we willing to pay to get that one thing we're focusing on? Third thing we want to take away from Kobe's too short life is he invested for the long game. Now, it's well known that many well-paid professional athletes and celebrities end up broke and bankrupt, but not Kobe Bryant. He was a savvy capitalist, and he co-founded a capital, uh, a, a, an investment firm before he graduated, retired from the NBA, uh, with a guy named Stiebel, and it was called Bryant Stiebel. Now, this venture capital firm invests in tech, media, and data startups. And he actually invested in real estate technology very heavily. Now, one of his investments was a $6 million share um, in a soft drink. And I can't remember the name of it, but I think it was called Something Armor. Somebody's going to remember. And that $6 million share was worth only a few years later, $200 million dollars when it was acquired by Coca-Cola a few years ago. Now, Bryant didn't luck into these type of investments. You know, he could have kicked back and thoroughly enjoyed his retirement. I'm sure he was enjoying it, but he understood the long game. A lot of people come off the court and they're miserable because they can't play basketball anymore. Well, he invested heavily in his kids, including his daughter, Gigi, who perished with him on the helicopter. But and he was on the way to a game with her uh, when he died. But he understood the long game. His stated goal was to create something in the investment realm that would be built on and remembered for generations. In fact, he said he expected that to be outshine what he did in basketball. Kind of expected from somebody who's a fierce competitor. Now, America was built on great investments by great investors. Have you all seen, you know, the men who built America. Uh, but Americans have largely become better spenders and consumers than investors. Uh, about 10,000 Americans turn 65 each day. And about six in 10 have less than $10,000 saved for retirement. What? This is the wealthiest nation in history, folks. We can do better than this, my friends. And I know that if you're on bigger pockets, you're going to do better. You are, um, but we don't want to be among those people who are relying on the government, on Social Security or some employer. We want to uh, build our own. Um, we want to build our own investment strategy, and I know that's why you're all part of Bigger Pockets. Now, lesson number three, therefore, was investing for the long game. Investment uh, lesson number two was. Uh, heavy focus and work, work ethic, work ethic. Uh, number one was loyalty. Number four lesson was how to bounce back from defeat. Kobe obviously lost hundreds of games in his life, but that's not what I'm talking about. Kobe had a massive personal failure in 2003 or so. This is very, very public, and uh, it's not something I am telling you for the first time. Uh, Kobe was accused of some terrible crimes, and he had just been married for two years. He didn't have any kids yet, and he was accused of a, a sexual assault. And Kobe, you know, could have easily lost his marriage over that. Uh, his wife did uh, file for divorce a number of years later, um, but Kobe fought for his marriage. Kobe fought to bounce back. He bounced back. And whether he did or didn't do what he was accused of, I have no idea. But I do know that he didn't wither. He didn't become hardened. He didn't become bitter. He seemed to be really sorry, and he bounced back. And so the question is, well, let me just say this. I've got a podcast called How to Lose Money. It's a wealth-building podcast where we interview successful investors, entrepreneurs, uh, business owners, and we talk about the mistakes they made and the pain they suffered on the way to the top. 
And here's one thing everybody has in common. We've all been there. We've all lost money. We've all had pain. We've all made mistakes. We've all made horrible personal and business mistakes. The question is, will those things define us? Because we all do these things, the question is, will they define you? If these things define you, then you will probably shrivel up and uh, go into a corner and not have a successful life. But if you don't let those things define you, if you bounce back and realize that one thing that's common to everybody is failure, uh, then you can have a successful life. We read in Think and Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill that the limitations we have on our lives are all right here, right here between our ears, okay? That's the only thing limiting you from becoming all you can be. I don't need to convince most people to be more humble. I need to convince most people to be as great as they were created and designed to be. And so that's my call for you today. Kobe Levy, Kobe Bryant left us a legacy of loyalty and hard work and focus and long-term investment bouncing back from failure that we can all learn from. As we mourn Kobe Bryant this week, let's ask ourselves what we can learn from the many triumphs in Kobe's too short life. Yeah, it was body armor. Thanks, Kildus. So, thank you for indulging me. Um, I, um, I've been thinking about this a lot this week, and um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to share this. I, I, as I've said many, many times, I, I can't believe I get to do this. I'm so grateful to Zach Gwynn and to Josh Dorkin, Brandon Turner, and all the wonderful folks over at Bigger Pockets that give all of us an opportunity to share uh, a platform like this. So I'm going to take a big drink of water, and then I'm going to look at your questions. So turning the corner here, let's open it up. And in the spirit of Kobe Bryant, let's be all we can be. Let's be as great as we can be. And one way to do that is to have a community of people you can bounce questions off. So I know this was pretty solemn, but right now I want to turn the corner and let's just rejoice in the good things in Kobe's life and let's take some time to answer all your real estate investment questions. So Ken Lewis, thank you. Arthur Hoskins, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Kill Deuce, yeah, thanks. Um, so um, Ken says, have two deals, hard to raise funds. Ken, you want to tell me more about that? That'd be awesome to hear more about what you have. Uh, if you're on the Facebook side and you've already asked a question, you're going to have to copy and paste it back in. If you're on the YouTube side, Hopefully, Nate Shields, that's my friend at Dude Real Estate, has been able to answer uh, your question already. So, Garfield Martinez says, hey, Garfield, how are you? Where are you from? Can you deduct HOA dues or HOA special assessments on your taxes? Yes, if it's a rental house. That's an expense of a rental house, a rental condo, an apartment building. If it's your personal home, you're going to have to ask your tax professional to see if you can. I'm going to guess you probably can't. I don't think so. So any tax professionals on here? By the way, you guys collectively know so much more than I do. And so I want you to answer each other's questions. I'll answer everything I can, but uh, please feel free to answer all of each other's questions, especially when you have a question like that that I can't say I'm 100% sure of the answer on. Ken Lewis over here on Facebook says, two homes on land, huh, price of 485,000 has 11 bedrooms and lawyer leasing first floor for $2,400. Okay, so Ken, um, so the lawyer's leasing the first floor of one home, second house has six bedrooms, is vacant right now. Okay, so you wanna, do you wanna, buy this as an investment? Do you want a house hack? What are you thinking? Is this an all commercial deal? Is this a residential slash commercial? Tell me more about it and what you're trying to do, Ken. Thanks. Where are you from, Ken? Uh, 
Garfield Martinez says Denver. It's a rental condo. Okay. Yeah, I would think so. I can't imagine that you couldn't. It's a cost of doing business. It'll come out of your net operating income. Daniel Gonzalez says, if you're not making additions to a lower level basement, just finishing it. Do you need to get city permits for putting up walls and HVAC and electrical? Absolutely, yes. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, my friends, but yes. Um, I've, I've been there. I've, I've finished, uh, including the room I'm sitting in right now, this basement and another basement, another house. Ken Lewis says he wants to house hack. Okay, so Ken, that sounds like a pretty good deal in Brooklyn. Um, 11 bedrooms total. Uh, you want a house hack? I guess I would add up, you know, how much rent you're going to save and how much rent and income you're going to bring in on these other rooms and see if you can get close to breaking even with the mortgage. If you are and you believe in the appreciation, it sounds really good. It's near a military base. Okay, that's awesome. Um, Les Bat says, question, buying my first property on the 25th and it's next door. Trying not to have them know that I'm the owner, but I want to manage it. Mm-hmm. It's going to be really, really hard to pull that off since you're next door. I know what you're trying to do, Les, and I think it's a great idea. Um, okay, so what if you had a friend of yours who shows up there? Like, can you pay a friend who shows up there to introduce yourself? Can you get a P.O. box for them to mail the rent to? Or can you get it ACH'd or wired into your bank account? Or use one of those software programs? What's that software program again where you can collect rent? There's no charge. Um, I would recommend that you just, you know, you never tell them. Kind of like that um, that move, that old movie Pillow Talk where you never tell them you're the landlord but you live right next door. Uh, I think it's possible. I think it's possible. I think it'll be a little tough. But I think you can pull it off. Get a friend involved. Donald Jones says, I've acquired... Because, I mean, how many times are you going to need to see him in person? Maybe just to give him the keys? Maybe have your friend do that and say he's just, and have him not lie, just tell him he's working for the owner. Donald Jones says, I've acquired three, um, <laughs> 33 unit homes, have line of credit in place for rehab work, have a back tax issue I'm dealing with, so the bank won't refinance the homes until the tax issue is resolved. Are there banks that will refinance without standing taxes? Gosh, that's a great question. I would go to the smallest local real, um, credit union you can and see if you can get help with them donald uh the smaller the credit union or the smaller the local bank the better so thank you for joining us thanks for the question that's the best answer i can give you um i don't think there is a set answer i think it's just going to be you're going to have to keep checking it out until you get somebody the smaller local banks are sometimes willing to overlook rules and i tell you my fr my son is using a small local bank and he's getting incredible terms for his real estate investments. Okay, do you have a question? Are you on Facebook? Are you on Bigger Pockets Live or you're on YouTube? Now's the chance to answer for, for me and for Nate to answer any questions that you have. Eric Pinkney, hey Eric, says I've raised over 100,000 in business credit, cool. Banks will not let me use my business cards as down payments. Huh, plastic but the banks still say that they want to see the down payment checking. Hmm. So you've got 100,000 you could take out, but you don't want to take it out. And the banks are saying they want to see you have your own cash. Uh, my answer would be the same as the one I just gave Donald. And that is I would go to the smallest local bank or credit union you can, you know, you might just have to take that money off the cards, off the credit cards or business credit and put it in your bank account and let it season for a while. And again, I'm not saying do anything sneaky. I mean, if they ask you, tell them that. But I think you might have to have that in a bank account for a while before they'll count it. Um, you could even make a random call or two to credit union loan officers and ask them if they would allow that. I-M-I-G-I-Z, hello, how are you? Peace, want to purchase commercial residential in Georgia for 425. I put earnest funds down already. I need an equity partner, credit is shot. I have an Airbnb next door, which will make it seven acres, wow. Uh, Nate at Dude Real Estate, what do you think? 
Um, is there anybody on here who'd be interested in partnering on this deal? Um, I think, you know, your best bet, I mean, if you could possibly get a hard money loan, maybe, and then repay it back with normal financing, uh, once your credit is repaired, that's really risky though. Those interest rates can be really, really high. Um, Alfonso Wright says, anyone from Massachusetts, I'm interested in Holyoke. My mom was born in Holyoke. There you go. 1919, 100 years ago. Uh, would like to know how the area is. Okay, so there's, there's a question for you. Alex, how should I get into real estate as a med school graduate? Alex, um, I personally have seven paths. I like to review with people to get into real estate. And Alex, I'd like to know a little more about your goals. I assume your goal is to make as much money as you can and enjoy your medical career. Um, if that's your goal, just give me a quick heads up on here and I will try to answer what I think is the best of these seven paths. Um, Garfield says, okay, I think Nate's answering your question. Kevin J. Hey, Kevin J. My father, by the way, if you like this content today on Kobe Bryant, or if you like what we're doing here at Bigger Pockets, can you give us a thumbs up? a like, a share, even a smiley face. That'd be great. That'll let Bigger Pockets, YouTube, and Facebook know that um, this content is valuable and it will keep me from getting fired. Okay, seriously, Kevin J says, my father needs to get my mother off the mortgage. I can buy the house for 178,000. Huh, worth 310,000. How do I go about that and sell the house to leverage into many rental properties. I don't know what to say, Kevin. Kevin, can you explain it again? I kind of understand. I think if you can buy it for 178, it's worth 310. Would you consider renting that house out or just renting it to your father? And then maybe taking the equity and getting an equity line to rental to get more rental properties? That's my first thought. But tell me more. Uh, Alex says, I'm in residency for neurosurgery. So Alex, I'm going to tell you something you probably don't want to hear, but I've talked to so many, many, is that a word? So many people in dentistry, medical field. I talked to a dentist at length today. Tommy, I will tell you the seven paths. Remind me. Uh, I talked to a dentist at length today. And honestly, the consensus is this. The best way while you're in full-time medical practice is to invest passively. That means taking a lot of effort to try to find somebody you really, really trust. That would be like a syndicator, and there's lots of them on bigger pockets. Uh, a fund, there's lots of them on bigger pockets. Uh, and you can invest with them. You know, Brandon Turner, the, the chief cheese here on bigger pockets. Uh, he said this week in something I read, he was making 15% from his single family homes, working really, really, really hard to get there. And then he realized he could invest passively with a syndicator and make 15% for doing absolutely nothing except vetting the right syndicator. So I highly recommend that you consider that. Okay. It may not be what you want to hear, Alex, but that's my honest answer. If you try to chase two rabbits, like I said earlier, it'll be really hard to catch either one. And so Dude Real Estate is answering Dane Hartman and Abby, thank you. Uh, and Gar Garfield Martinez, um, okay. Alex, if I can help you anymore, if you wanna do a 15 minute call, just visit me on my website and I'll be glad to set up a call with you uh, or anybody else. I do a once a week call, by the way, for anybody who wants to take a deeper dive, you can just reach out to me again. I'm Paul Moore and my bigger pockets profiles here. Uh, that's a no obligation call. We don't charge for it. We just try to dive deeper for anything. I can't get answered here. And also you can talk to dude real estate. He's got a lot of great answers and he's also a bigger pockets author, George Shetler. Hi, George says I'm wholesaling targeting multiple multifamily two to fourplex. All the homes I find are actively being rented. That's great. And mostly up to date. Thus the owners are hesitant to sell. Hmm. What do I do? How do you get them to sell? Nate, do you have any ideas on that? I can't think of any way George to get them to sell if they don't want to sell. 
Um, basically remind them the recession's coming. Tell them, you know, a lot of people that didn't sell in 2007 and 8 were sorry when the market crashed and their values went down in 2009. Those would be some things I would say. And the good news is that would be all true for the seller. The bad news is it would also be true for you as a buyer. So be really careful. Now, I know wholesaling is a great way to go with that. Okay, so Tristan... Fogel, Seth, I'm sorry, says, hey, I'm going to have 30,000 cash saved up when I turn 18 this August. Hey, thumbs up for Tristan. Great job. I'm keeping five grand for a car that isn't my uncle's, which I'm driving now and food and stuff. What is the minimum cash cushion I should keep with the 25,000 to work with? I'm planning on house cat hacking. I, I don't really have a great answer for you, Tristan, other than, like, I mean, use spend as little as you humanly can through your late teens and 20s and try to invest all you can so i don't know if that really is super helpful but that's my answer i mean as far as cushion maybe a few thousand for car repairs and something going wrong with your house i i think that would be my best answer nabil mamut says how do you deal with noise complaints in multifamily homes so nabil thank you for joining us today thank you tristan as well um i don't know um i would say uh i would say you know try to reason with these people and try to you know potentially threaten to evict them if they won't shut up or quiet down and uh, I think that that would be the best way I would go about it. I don't think there's one answer to that. I think scream better tenants would be my ultimate answer. Uh, David Williams says, could you go through the BP marketplace and talk through how you would choose a property and what steps you would go through after deciding on a property? David, that might be a, uh, another, uh, something for another day that we could do. That would take a while. And I don't know what type of property. What type of property are you interested in, David? I don't know that I can answer that today, but I'll try to give you a little answer. Okay. So a lot of people, and I'm answering Tommy, Tommy Doffelmeyer. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to take a quick break from questions here and give you guys a little uh, information. I'm publishing a book on self-storage investing. Bigger Pockets is my publisher. And... Um, we are going to, in that book, review seven paths to commercial real estate investing success. And uh, a lot of people, me, for one, for years wanted to get into commercial real estate, but didn't know who to trust, didn't know where to start, didn't know how to get in. And so I finally did get in, and I was very, very happy to do so. But Tommy, um, there are seven paths to get into commercial real estate investing and I highly recommend that you consider one of these paths and put your head down and run down this path. So here's the seven paths to get into commercial real estate investing if you're interested. Number one, you can do something similar to Brandon Turner's stacking. Now there's a good book on multifamily investing. It's called The Complete Guide. I'm looking at my bookshelf. I don't know why, because I can't read it this far away. Um, the Complete Guide to Buying and Selling Apartment Buildings. And Brandon Turner likes this book. I like this book. Um, but it's got some information on there about how to build up a portfolio and the best ways to do that. Uh, so what I would recommend, Tommy, would be to buy a self-storage, a mobile home park, a multifamily, whatever. F fix it up, rent it up, refinance it or sell it and then buy the next bigger one with the proceeds and then you just keep working your way up i met a guy in arlington texas in 2016 he started in 1993 with one thousand dollar bonus he got from his mechanic job he bought a duplex and then he sold that for a twenty six thousand twenty seven thousand dollar profit then he bought a fourplex sold it, bought an eight plex, sold it, bought a 10 or 20, sold it. And when I met him, he was selling an $11 million, 132 unit multifamily in Arlington, Texas. So um, it's definitely doable. That's path one. And that took a long time. Path two would be capital raising. Be careful. Okay. The SEC is watching 
and you can't do this illegally. If you want to be a good capital raiser, you should join a company, become a principal in the company, and raise capital. That might mean you partner with somebody who has more experience and you raise the capital. Or you can get a broker-dealer's license. So capital raising is the second path into commercial real estate. The third path is deal finding. If you have great skills in direct marketing, you can work the phone, you can write cards, you can uh, do direct mail, you can do internet marketing. <clears throat> I don't think that would work. You have relationships with people who might want to sell their properties. You can be a deal finder. And what you're going to want to do is go negotiate a deal with a syndicator, a commercial operator, and you're going to want to make sure before you do the deal that you... Um, uh, have all that negotiated up front on paper and you say, hey, I don't want a commission. I'm not a realtor, unless you are. And then you try to get a piece of the deal. And by getting a piece of that deal, you get in the conference rooms, you get on the conference calls, you get, um, you get to be part of the deal and grow the deal. And you can learn. The next path, that's path number four. You're not going to want to hear it, folks, but it's get a job. What? Get a job. Yeah, if you're, especially if you're young, like the 18 year old person who asked me a question earlier, Tristan, um, you know, hey, you may want to get a job in real estate. You can get a job as a commercial broker, that's a real estate agent, a commercial lender, an asset manager, or a property manager. One of the largest players in all the multifamily world <clears throat> right now was actually started out in college as a porter. And his name's Rick Graff, G-R-A-F, for Pinnacle Property Management. He is now has the second or third largest property management firm, firm in America, but he started out at the lowest possible level in an apartment. And he got the job and he worked his way up. There's all kinds of people who have worked these four paths to the top. Gary Keller, uh, the most famous real estate investor, excuse me, I should say agent of all time, started out with a W-2 job in real estate. Actually, he uh, became a realtor. So I guess that wasn't W-2. Let me correct myself, a 1099. But he took a job as a realtor for years. And then he now owns the largest real estate agency, as far as I know, in the world. And so that's a path for you. So get a job is the fourth path. The fifth path is be a millionaire. What? What I meant to say is if you have access to a lot of money, you made a lot of money in Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, you made a lot of money uh, through an inheritance. You have sold an IT firm. You have access to millions of dollars through your family, friends, whatever. You can actually build a team and start out big. Like you can go in and try to buy a $5 million property day one. If you do that, be really careful. Get really good people around you to help you. Don't just do it on your own. So I think that's the fifth path. The sixth path is my favorite. And for my um, neurosurgery friend, um, I want to say the sixth path is the path that you, I think, and many, many others should consider going down. And that sixth path, uh, Alex, is um, actually being a passive investor. So there's two types of passive investors. There's one who works really, really hard uh, to uh, find the right operator, trust them implicitly, go spend time with them, invest heavily in whatever deals they do. That's one. Then the other type is one who's not as trusting and they, they do the same amount of work on the front end, but they don't invest in whatever deals they do. They go out and check every deal themselves out. In other words, they go out and they fly out, they do the due diligence, they go through all the numbers, they go through the lending, and they figure out all the details on every deal before they invest. Whichever way you do it, passive investing is a great plan for many, many people who want to be involved in real estate and still get all the tax benefits. Now, the seventh and final path is find a coach or mentor. Now, a coach is somebody you pay like I did, I paid $25,000 to a company to mentor me, to fast track me into multifamily investing. But you can also get, uh, that's a coach, paid coach. You can also get a mentor, which would be where you 
go and offer to work for free for somebody either in your town or somewhere else and you offer to serve them maybe you do excel really well maybe you do seo maybe you do spreadsheets maybe you do i said that already something else and you offer to serve them and you do so well and they love you so much that they feel obligated to hire you uh, eventually maybe you'll end up being a partner with them okay so that's the seventh and final path tommy dolphemeyer did that help let me know. If that was helpful to you, please give me a thumbs up, like, something like that, smile. Just let me know you're out there. Okay, so we're winding down here. It's 42 minutes after the hour. And so if you have a question you haven't got an answer to yet on the Bigger Pockets platform, the YouTube, or the Facebook platform, Nate Shields and I are dying to answer your questions. So please do me a favor copy and paste your question back in because now we've got hundreds of entries i would guess over on youtube probably dozens on facebook and it's pretty hard to keep track of all of them uh yes you're welcome thanks tommy dolphemeyer that's very kind of you alum st says what is the minimum to syndicate alum can you can you tell me a little more about that I mean, do you mean the minimum size deal, the minimum dollars you need to have personally? I assume that's what you need, but I want to make sure I answer the right question. Alfonso Wright says, love this show. Hey, man, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, someone says, I'm a pro on BP. Where should I start? Um, I'm going to let Nate answer that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, all right, what else do we have here? Kevin J says, my dad and I have similar goals and want to buy for a retirement for him and build mine as well. How would you use the equity in the original house with the knowledge experience you know you have? Yeah, so I would consider, folks, I would consider Kevin J, I should say, uh, maybe a corporate landlording or Airbnb arbitrage situation. If anybody on here doesn't know what that is, it wants to know, I can tell you. I wrote an article on Bigger Pockets. You can probably Google it. Uh, how to make $10,000 without quitting your day job. But I found out that some people took that article and ran with it. And I know two guys on Bigger Pockets. Maybe they're on here today. Uh, I actually met them at the Bigger Pockets conference in 2019 in October in Nashville face-to-face, -face, they're making not $10,000 without quitting their day job. They're making $70,000. They're grossing $70,000 without quitting their day job, and they're netting uh, thirty dollars to $35,000 a month. That's using corporate Airbnb arbitrage. If you want to know more about that, raise your hand, and I can tell you a little more. You can also do subject to, Kevin, uh, subject to loans, lease option sandwiches. You can invest in another house and house hack. Uh, if you can find anything undervalued, which is very, very hard right now, refinance it, pull your equity out and uh, plow it into another project and keep growing. That's a great way to go. Ross Nelson says arbitrage. So an Airbnb arbitrage means you rent an apartment you furnish it, you put all the utilities on it, you take beautiful photographs, and then you Airbnb it out from there. So you're renting it, but you're renting it out to somebody else. Okay, so you don't have to own it. It's not truly an arbitrage because you're acting, actually adding a ton of value by furnishing it and getting utilities. But this is a great way to make a lot of money. If you do corporate, long-term corporate housing, you can make a lot of money for a, a little effort. If you want to do Airbnb, you can actually make even more money, but not for a little effort, for a lot of effort. And so those are some things that I recommend to people. You're welcome, Kevin. Uh, and, I, and I recommend that you consider that. If you want more information on the Airbnb corporate arbitrage, you can reach out to me. I'm Paul Moore. And you can reach out to me at my Bigger Pockets profile. I just pass along my friend's information. I just don't have it right in front of me now. Film Captive, hey, welcome, says, is there any lender that you know that will provide a HELOC on an investment property? Absolutely. 
What if it's in your business name? Absolutely. Uh, smaller, the better. Go to a local credit union, local bank. My son uses, like, I mean, if you were in Lynchburg, Virginia, First National Bank of Alta Vista, I think. It's a local bank in a town you've never heard of. And so pretty cool how these local smaller banks and credit unions will work with you, how flexible they'll be. Now, you can actually put it in your own name, get the loan in your name, and then transfer it over to an LLC with the lender's approval, of course. You're going to be on the hook for the loan either way. It's not going to be, you're not going to be shielded from the loan repayment uh, by the LLC. And not that anybody wants to do that. Um, okay, so what other questions do you have? Uh, we're getting ready to wind down here. And I'm going to get a drink of water. And we'll look for our last few questions. Um, and uh, then we'll wrap up. And we'll have a great weekend. So Dude Real Estate, okay, he's working there with Leonardo. Thank you. Um, if that's all the questions we have, if you haven't got an answer to your question, then I haven't seen it. Because I've answered every question that I've seen that my friend Dude Real Estate, Nate Shields, has not answered. So copy and paste it in now or forever hold your peace. It sounds like a wedding, doesn't it? Anyway, so uh, thank you for joining today. If you want more information um, about real estate investing, I highly recommend that you spend the money to join a premium membership level with Bigger Pockets. We've got a pro membership and we've got another premium membership uh, level. It is the best investment I've ever made in my life. I've been in business for myself for 20 eight years now almost and it's the very best single investment i ever made and i highly recommend that you get a premium uh membership with bigger pockets if you're looking for more information than i couldn't provide today you can connect with dude real estate that's nate shields and if you want more information from me you can connect with me um at uh, paul moore there on Bigger Pockets, or you can visit my website, wellingscapital.com. Got a few more questions coming in, and then we're going to wrap up. So Jose Martinez says, where can I find pre foreclosure properties? Um, go to the local, set up a search for your local newspaper uh, website and look for words like foreclosure, um, uh, foreclosure sale, uh, lawyers, um, a deed of trust sale in certain states and look for um, houses that are advertised typically two to three and a half weeks before they hit the courthouse steps. Jose, that's the best way to do it. There's also some lists you can purchase. And so um, I don't know which are the best list. IMIGIZ says West Bank said they don't have room for additional development loans. What does that mean? I don't know. Great question. Uh, Lady Plants says, this show's never long enough. I love all the information you give. How nice of you. Thanks, Lady Plants. Leonardo is talking to Dude Real Estate. Kevin J, thank you. Love BP and all the live webinars. Thanks. That means a lot. Uh, Carleone says, how to make a proposal to an old neighbor. He has the worst house in the best neighborhood. He's 100? Carleone, that is a great potential relationship. We just invested in a deal where somebody in Michigan was 95 and they were still operating a very large mobile home park. And after seven years of contacting them quarterly and just staying in touch and building the relationship, uh, we were able to uh, invest with our operating partner in that deal. So Artemis says, do you recommend using the Burr method in condos? I say that as a joke. Uh, yes, I do. I think that would be a great way to do it. Uh, and Dude Real Estate says, go talk to him and be honest. Yeah, maybe you can put some kind of offer on it and say, look, you're not going to live forever. <laughs> uh, I'd love to buy your house when you sell. And maybe you can get a contract in advance. Ryan Wolf says, hey, I am new to the group. Hey, Ryan. Great content. Do you have any opinions on buying real estate in Canada as the property values are a lot higher than the typical properties you would be, I think you're saying are the properties higher 
in value. Uh, don't know. Does anybody have any advice for my f- new friend, Ryan Wolf? <laughs> Ryan, thanks for joining us. I don't know about Canada. Um, I get occasional questions on that, but I don't know that much about it. Um, Mashia, sorry for pronouncing it wrong, Matthews. Hi, Mashia. I have a tax property that I should be getting the deed to this year. Okay. What kind of funding should I seek for renovation for a rental? Again, I'd go to a local bank or credit union and, uh, you know, you can use private money, hard money, or perhaps a line of credit, according to Nate Shields at Dude Real Estate. Uh, Ryan, I'm sorry I failed to answer your question. I, I would love to connect with you. If, it, if I can help you in any way, let me know. I'm sure Dude Real Estate, you can look him up on Bigger Pockets. We'll be able to uh, be glad to help with you. He's closer to Canada. He's in Madison, Wisconsin, where it's kind of cold like Canada. Maybe he can help more. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. It's about seven minutes until the top of the hour. And I can't believe I get to do this. I really appreciate Zach Gwynn, everybody at Bigger Pockets. I appreciate all of you. And I thank you for joining me. And I look forward, hopefully, uh, we'll get to see you again next Friday. And hopefully we'll have a happier topic than considering what we did at the top of the hour. Thanks again. I appreciate all of you. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. And I wish you the very, very best in everything you do. All right. Take care.